All right. Welcome, everybody. Everybody presumably got a great night's sleep last night, is all rested, ready to go, ready for this new adventure. Um, I want to welcome you, um, the class of 2023. Jocelyn Sanchuk said, everybody's taking calculus, so they should be able to do the math. I'm the class of 1982. Don't do the math. It just <laughs> depresses me. But I do want to welcome you to kind of the next stage of the advent your professional adventure. This has been the end of a rigorous selection process for us, and we're absolutely delighted with the outcome. And in a couple of days, you'll take a picture like this with white coats and stethoscopes, and that'll really signify the beginning of what's going to be the next part of your professional adventure. This is a process that we believe is very rigorous, and you were evaluated, and what you've done previously was evaluated amongst over 8,000 of your peers, a very distinguished group, and you were selected amongst those peers. And it's maybe a little bit arduous, but completely rewarding and gets more rewarding as you go forward. So again, congratulations on making it this far, and it's our job to make sure that you're successful as we move forward. When I spoke to the class of 2022 last year, I talked about a couple of things that happened during the arc of my own personal career from being a medical student here at Einstein, going to University of California, San Francisco to do medical residency and actually seeing the development and the change in the treatment of a couple of diseases that were really seemingly miraculous at the time, but I guarantee that you will have the opportunity to see changes in medicine that you will believe to be seemingly miraculous and actually uh, a wonderful, wonderful advances, not only for medicine, but for society and humanity in general. You'll actually be a part of those things. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that today. What I do wanna talk to you about is you are now entering another family. Um, and that's the family of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And it's a family that I'm so proud to be a part of, and I think is a, a, a wonderful environment to become uh, a physician. And so we're not gonna talk about HIV and we're not gonna talk about heart attacks, but I'll be happy to talk about either of those two things anytime you want me to. But what I do wanna talk about is uh, Einstein and what Einstein means to me, what Einstein I hope will mean to you at some point in time in the future. So this institution was conceived of and really responded to a need, a need for socially just access to training in medicine and socially just provision of care. And there were inspirational leaders who actually recognized that need and decided to found a medical school. Uh, these were leaders from uh, Yeshiva University and obviously our namesake, uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, it is a remarkable, from, the, from its very beginnings, it's been a remarkable group of people. And to this day, it remains a remarkable group of people. <laughs> Um, in many ways, and in all mission areas, provision of socially just care, the development of new knowledge, um, education and innovations in medical education. And at the risk of leaving out most people, I want to just take a few exemplars of leaders um, at the level of student, the student body, at the level of the faculty, at the level of the staff, who actually contribute to Einstein being what it is. And we can't really start without talking about our founder, Albert Einstein is not a physician, not a biomedical researcher, but arguably he is the most famous scientist in the history of humankind. And despite some reluctance, agreed to allow this college to be named after him. But there were a couple of provisos that were really very important to him and very important to the founders of the institution. And they're highlighted in a letter that hangs in my office right now that letter says basically we are committed to a collective effort by our people to make contributions in the field of medical science. And importantly, it will welcome students of all races and creeds. This he believed to be a worthy cause that he was willing to support by naming the institution. Now, you can say you're gonna start a medical school, but it really does take some inaugural faculty to come to teach at a medical school when there wasn't one that existed. And that's that's the next uh, piece. The inaugural faculty were really a remarkable group of people who took a leap of faith. Oftentimes from uh, very prestigious institutions elsewhere in the country, 
Sometimes for reasons that they weren't advancing at those places, but other times because they just believed in what we were going to do here. And they came for that reason. And these are the people that really make up the fabric and the origins of who we are and what we are, and I think follow through on that to this day. And they include, unusually at that time, women on our faculty, Berta Shera, Salome Walsh, Isabel Rappin, but also a number of other people who were well known in their fields who came here to teach and to work at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So um, it, it, again, it's a, it's a leap of faith. There's nothing here. In fact, most of these folks came when the doors hadn't even opened yet to students. Um, but, but in fact, and in fact, it was not going to be another three or four years before there was even the first graduating class. There was one person who was extremely influential to me. He was the founding director of the Department of Neuroscience here. And he was editor in chief of brain research for many years. And he was one of the best instructors that I had at the college. And he turned out to be the longest standing dean at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. That's Dominic Purpura. He was an amazing exemplar for me personally. And again, this is part of my own personal bias here and really demonstrated to me what it meant to be a physician scientist. And this is part of the thing that really directed me in my own career. And, and I'm hoping and I, I fully expect that you will find people like this individually here that you um, want to emulate in some way in your career. Okay, so the other thing that had to happen was you can have a medical school and faculty, but if you don't have students, uh, it's not really a medical school. And this was yet another leap of faith. There were some people who wouldn't have gotten into other medical schools, but there were other people who actually would have gotten into many medical schools who decided to come to Einstein. And there are a number of early students who, had, who made great successes here. One of the people I want to point out is Carol Burnett. She was the first African-American woman, class of 1960, who graduated from Einstein. And she was a, a native of the Bronx. She was an amazingly successful person despite, after graduating, discrimination because of her race and her gender, became a leader and a dean at Mount Sinai, and also a leader in a national organization, the AAMC. A remarkable career trajectory despite some of the things that happened to her after she graduated. The folks um, here, in the spirit of these original students, continue to excel in all aspects of what we do, and you will excel in the chosen aspects of what we do as well. There will be many opportunities for you in all mission areas and in all levels of integration of medicine and science that we do here and you'll have an opportunity to be exposed to all those things and actually make decisions about what it is you want to do as part of your career. So locally, here at the Bronx, on this campus, the science that's, that, that goes on here is absolutely amazing. I came from a pretty potent scientific institution immediately before I came to Einstein at Johns Hopkins. It's every bit as good here. Um, in fact, we are doing work um, that really spans the spectrum of translational research from T0, the most basic research, up to and including healthcare, um, healthcare implementation types of research. Whether that's uh, you know, developing the full connectome of a model organism, C. elegans, and what does that mean? Well, it means you understand every single synapse in the, that these 300 neurons make in this animal, and okay, so that's nice, but what does it mean? A reporter asked Scott Emmons what he thought it meant and what he thought it meant if we understood that for a human being. Now, that's a much bigger problem, but you know, we might understand consciousness, which is a pretty profound uh, degree of understanding. But that being said, there are a number of other things that I think are going on, including figuring out the best ways to treat various forms of, of breast cancer, using oncotyping, manipulating the immune system to therapeutic benefit in the formation of vaccines or the formation of other therapies, development of the best treatment options for opiate use disorders, and implementing them in our community, um, treatment of uh, really devastating diseases globally like Ebola, and uh, fully understanding the effect of all parts of the brain on addictive behavior. So the cerebellum, which controls motor function and balance, and previously thought to be involved in addiction at all, but, but in fact in neuroscience here it does seem to be very involved in addiction. And finally, um, Research that's, that's really epidemiologic research and trying to understand, for example, in this case, the effect of exposures of 9-11 first responders um, and, and what the implications are that for their long-term health. 
So uh, in addition to research here on campus, there are going to be opportunities for you to care for people of the Bronx and also be a part of education and training people of the Bronx. This involves a, a number of wonderful opportunities and things that actually have happened here in its origins. One of them was last year we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Einstein Community Health Outreach Clinic. The ECHO Clinic is a free clinic completely run by medical students, providing care for the uninsured. It is actually a remarkable, uh, remarkable program that many of you will have an opportunity to work in and to be a part of. Uh, in addition to providing medical care in ECHO, there's um, a number of other clinics around the Bronx, and Juan Robles, who's a product of the ECHO Clinic before he became a doctor, ultimately became a doctor, now runs ambulatory clinics in the Bronx. He's also an immigrant and native from the Bronx. There are a number of enrichment programs for, for people in our community at the high school level, at the college level, at the post-college, post-baccalaureate kind of levels. And these include Bronx Hope, uh, the uh, enrichment programs that are run uh, out of Einstein, and a program that's specifically designed for underrepresented in medicine, and those are people who are disadvantaged, who are interested in medicine but don't have the opportunity mentoring in medicine. So a wonderful set of opportunities that you will be exposed to as medical students here at Einstein. The other thing is that I've, I spoke to a, number of, a couple of students this morning who are very interested in global health, and the programs in global health here are amazing. They are run out of, um, out of the Global Health Center that's uh, led by Lou Weiss and Jill Rothman. But there are a number of programs that target women's health internationally, that target uh, diabetes, TB, HIV. And these are opportunities that are all over the globe. And they're all over the globe. And you will have an opportunity to make an impact on health, not only in the Bronx, but internationally, if you become part of one of the Global Health Centers and, and programs. So I don't want to spend a lot of time. I, I spent probably twice this length of time last year, and Josh said to me, you know, they're not going to remember a word you said. <laughs> now I'm listening to you. So I decided to shorten it. And, and really what I want to do is make a couple of points. This is a, an amazing part of the next phase of your education. We obviously have to teach you the language of medicine, but we have to teach you to think like a doctor. We have to teach you to approach clinical problems in a way that um, that, uh, that reminds me of a quote by Einstein. Um, you know, knowledge, uh, and I love this quote, knowledge is limited, but imagination circles the world. So we want you to, to develop that baseline knowledge, but we also want to foster your imagination and thinking about problems in medicine, because what I believe is that this is true, but the combination of the two is incredibly powerful. How are you going to do this? Well. The good news is we have a wonderful education department. We have what I call the MD whisperers, our medical Sherpas. These are folks who are going to help you get through this process. Sometimes it can be a little bit complicated. Sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. But these are all people that you're going to meet. They are wonderful educators. They are wonderful role models. They are wonderful doctors. Um, please, uh, and you won't have to worry about this because you will take advantage of their expertise and they will be available to help you in all aspects of what it is that you want to do, uh, whether it's the MD program, uh, 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 master's programs of various kinds, or if you're in the MD, PhD program. So welcome. Have a great year. Have a great four years. Have a great six years or eight years if you're in the MD, PhD program. It's, it's great to have you here. And I do want to thank uh, Gordon Earl Shop and most importantly, Cookie Kurtz for helping me with some of the slides. So thanks, and I look forward to speaking you to speaking to you more in the future.